So the three of us are all, have all been on the ballots. Um, and when it came, so we all got the information from the Board of Elections about the audits that were going to follow after the uh, primary. But we also were all informed about becoming poll watchers. And Allegra being so deeply concerned for so many years about the issues around elections, she reached out to try to coordinate something locally that we could all that we could get enough people to actually go to these audit to well to do poll watching first and then to go to the audits. So through our means of communications, we got several people going to polls on the, on the 19th. And then subsequently, we got pretty much the same group going to the audits. So um, I think that that's why I suggested we start with Diane, because Diane, um, <laughs> As the, as the lawyer assigned to this by the campaign alerted her, and she was the only lawyer, I think, involved I in the poll so. watching. Sure. Yeah. So the lawyer said, My help, Diane. Yeah. Simi Purchase. My path was a little different. I'd signed up to be a poll watcher with Carrie and Allegra, but I told the campaign a long time ago as a volunteer that I was a lawyer, so I knew I'd be poll watching, um, and days before the election I got an email from uh, the campaign and then a phone call from the campaign that they wanted to train uh, lawyers for the day of. Um, so I had a webinar training and it was not very complicated. They explained that we could be inside of a polling place. We could observe. We could also speak to voters. The thing that we couldn't do was to interfere with someone casting a ballot. And that was basically what they covered, in addition to that we could be challenged with certificates. So they gave us the certificate that we had. Uh, all the people at the webinar had one from uh, Arthur Schwartz, who is the counsel that the campaign has been using since before uh, the petitions. And he was the, uh, the lawyer that helped to have the petitions uh, filed properly with the board uh, back a few months ago. Well, they, the campaign was concerned that the certificate from uh, Arthur may not be accepted, so they gave us a different certificate that was signed by Bernie Sanders. So we, had, we were armed to the teeth with certificates. They said, make many copies, just in case. And they gave us complaint forms. Uh, the lawyers had complaint forms, a number that we could call as a, a lawyer for the campaign. Sorry, it's hard to understand me uh, with my congestion. Uh, people were going to be manning a phone in Brooklyn at a, a center where lawyers would answer questions, uh, one team from other lawyers and another team for any voters that had issues. <clears throat> so all of that was before election day. Election day arrived, I went up to Dobbs Ferry after I voted here in Hastings. It was all uneventful. Uh, we were told not to go to uh, our districts where we were on the ballot, so I left District 16 here in Hastings and I went to Dobbs, District 17, and I checked my phone just to see what was going on by 8.30 or so in the morning, and sure enough there was an email from the campaign saying, the hotspot we identify in all of Westchester is SUNY Purchase. We need you to be there. So I left Dobbs Ferry and went up to SUNY Purchase and encountered issues finding the actual polling place. There were only two signs on campus and it was impossible really to find where the building was. Um, so as I approached, I called this into the campaign to the hotline and said <coughs> one of the things we were told which seemed, I thought, you know, uh, just rudimentary. Of course you'd have signs at any polling place. I was picturing Hastings in my mind where it's very evident where the polling center is. How hard is that? Well, it was very hard. Where There's an enormous campus up at SUNY. I finally found it, but I probably asked 10 students and other adult people, professors or their families, walking along roads, and no one knew that there was any voting on campus. They were all trying to direct me off campus to something called the Purchase Community House, 
which I almost then decided to go to if I couldn't find this polling place. I figured they'd know where the other one was. But uh, I drove the campus enough that I, I eventually found this one sign. Anyway, I, I got there, I gave them my certificate. I was cordial, explained. Uh, I think it was the only time I explained that I was from the Bernie Sanders campaign. And I never spoke his name aloud again, because I know that we're not supposed to campaign or have any kind of electioneering. Uh, and I didn't want to have that be an issue. So for the first five minutes, things went very smoothly. <laughs> and uh, I thought I'd be kind. Some of the things they discussed on this webinar, too, was uh, try to cut the tension in case people feel tense that we're there. That as a poll watcher, we could cause that just being there. In addition to if we say that we're a legal poll watcher, evidently that's even more stressful to people. So I offered if I could get anyone coffee or tea. I went around to the five workers. And while this was unfolding, a voter encountered a problem. There was no one in the room, and then a voter entered, and that was an issue. So I listened. I didn't leave for coffee. And as it turned out, three voters in a row had issues, so I never left for coffee. Um, I had this fellow came, a lovely, they're all students that I saw that day, um, and he was raising his voice somewhat to the woman who had the book. He said, I'm a registered Democrat. And she said, you're not here. And he said, I know I have to be there. I have my voter registration card. And they kind of taunted him and said, oh, really? You have it? Which I found odd, odd yes. at the very least. Uh, and he took it out. They weren't willing to look at it. They just said, well, you're not in the book. And, and you can't vote. And he started to walk out. He was really upset. I followed him and said, do you mind? May I speak with you? I'll tell you, 100% of the students, when I said, may I speak with you, every single student from that point, which was about 10 in the morning, until 9 o'clock at night, not one of them refused. They were all very happy to speak with me, and eventually, when Carrie came, they wanted to tell somebody what happened. And they wanted help. They wanted direction. And they wanted to have someone understand their upset and their frustration. So this fellow let me take a picture of his voter registration card, which showed him registering on September 25th, his name, his address, which is the campus address, which is the building we're standing in. It's all 735 Anderson Hill Road. The building that I was standing in was the student activity building, and he had a campus address, exact same thing with an apartment number. Wow. His polling place on his card showed that address, and it was his mailing address. Of course, also <coughs> on that same card was that the primary election was to be on September 13th of 2016. But uh, despite that, there he was, trying to vote, and they turned him away without an affidavit ballot. Now, I asked them very kindly, could he have an affidavit ballot, and they refused. And early in the day, I didn't recognize that we could push through that. So this fellow left. Uh, two women, within a minute or two of all this happening, came. One was upset as I was speaking to this fellow. This woman already was told that she was not in the book. And another poll worker looked her up uh, on this small computer that they had and explained to her that despite that she's a student and lives on campus, she was registered some eight or nine miles away at this purchased community house. They said to her, well, do you have a car? She said, no, I'm a freshman. I, I don't have a car. And they said, well, maybe you could take a bus there. And the girl said, there isn't a bus that goes from our campus to get there. And she was, of course, very upset. <coughs> So they denied her the right to vote and didn't offer her any kind of affidavit ballot. They just told her that this was the wrong polling place, even though she lives here. It didn't matter. So she left. Then a woman arrived and said that she had checked her voter registration the night before. And she was registered as a Democrat in this polling place. And they were not showing her in the book. And when they looked up on this computer, they didn't see any registration for her at all. She was upset and texted a friend who came over and started arguing her case. And the poll workers were unfazed. They wouldn't budge. They just said, sorry. Fix it for November, which was their thing early in the day. They treated these students. They said, well, that's, that's a problem for you. You need to fix it for November. Maybe you're registered where you live at home. This is what the woman with the book would say. And the student would say, I just checked with your colleague. And they looked on a computer system where I'm just not registered at all. But they didn't seem to really want to help. And as the day went along, they were getting less helpful, more rude, <coughs> more intimidating. After these three, three students, it was still pretty early. This is at 11 o'clock, I want to say. 
the fellow who identified himself as the lead poll worker, uh, William uh, Royale, we called him Bill, he came running after me at one point when I was trying to talk to a student, and he had a cell phone in his hand. With this, one of the people from the campaign, Sam King, a young college grad, big, tall, strapping fellow, had arrived because I'd asked the campaign for help. Uh, I thought I needed to have someone else there. There were two doors, so I couldn't chase all the students as these things were unfolding. I got to speak with three, but others, I would say about one out of four people actually got to cast their ballots. And if people went to go out of a different door, there was no chance I could go find them. It's not a big area, maybe, you know, twice this size, but they would leave the building. The door from the, the actual room we were in was very near to the both exits to the building, one towards where they lived, towards the housing, and one towards like a quad area and other buildings. Um, as best I could, I ran after people, literally, like chased them to find out their stories. But at this point, Sam arrived to help me, so I didn't have to do all this. So he got to hear this phone call that Will, you know, William, Bill was heading the phone saying, speak to the board, the Westchester board wants to speak to you. So I took the phone and first said, Sam, do you want to take it? And he said, no, why don't we both take it? So we left it so we could both hear it. Woman Dottie says, if you're a poll watcher, you have to be just that. You have to watch and you can't be in the building and you can't speak to the, the student voters. So I let her say her spiel. She said the same thing over and over a few times. And I finally said to her, listen, Dottie, I went to training yesterday, and that's not what we were told. We were told that we could be in the building and we could speak to students, and that's what I plan to do. I literally called and got Arthur Schwartz, who said, stay in the building and fight with them, but try to make it nice anyway. <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> OK. And I called the US Attorney's Office. Uh, it's a lawyer's hotline for issues that day. I left a very succinct on their tape message and said, it's urgent. And they called me back a few minutes later and said, unequivocally, you can be inside. You can speak with people. You can be inside the building. If you need to, call the police. So that's basically the way I operated for the rest of the day. When the poll workers challenged me, which they did, I said, we need to call the police. Because I'll, I'll do that. I'm happy to do that. And eventually, we, we did call the police, carry that. Um, I'm just going to say, at this point, I think maybe people might have a few questions or want you to elaborate on something. Yeah, I think they maybe fill in about the affidavits. Yeah. So Eventually, uh, that was another phone call, I think. Uh, someone from the campaign called to say that there was a case going on on election day, which I didn't know when I left my house at 6 a.m., and that the issue before the court was that some of the voters that were unregistered as Democrats uh, were now considered independents, and they were being urged to cast affidavit ballots, and then eventually, if they could put pieces together and see that the people were actually registered Democrats and some system error or clerical issue caused them to be unregistered, their vote perhaps could count. So with this, I took a more aggressive stance and anybody who was denied a right to vote, I'd say, you have to go back inside and explain to them. I stood outside the door, in the building, but outside the door, because it seemed too contentious to be in the actual space where people were voting. The hostility from the workers toward me, I felt was unfair to the students. As it turned out, despite that I stood right outside the door, uh, they were continuing with this intimidation with the students. They'd come out and student after student explained that they were rude to them, they would say things about me being outside. <laughs> and, uh, and they would say to them, if you don't like the lines, then just leave. And your vote isn't worth a spit anyway. And that's a quote. At wow. least two or three well, students who didn't hear year. each other over a span of time way. came out and told me wow. that. That they, they were told their vote isn't worth a spit anyway. Wow. Yeah. And they would deny nobody got an affidavit ballot? Once I got aggressive and demanded them, and then I had the students do that, and Carrie came and she was great yeah. with that. We just wouldn't let them refuse. We made them give those affidavit ballots. We got pretty confrontational, and they had to give in to that. I'll, I'll explain what I did. Turn that over to Karen. So, so um, through a couple of hours, I was getting these SOS texts from Diane. So I, I, and I went to two places where there was nothing going on. So I just went right over to SUNY Purchase, and um, I didn't have the training, and nobody told me I had to be nice.
<laughs> so I went right into the room and I heard this woman talking to students, a bunch of students, and I immediately said to her, stop intimidating them. And she said, I'm not intimidating anybody. And I, I, don't, I wish I remembered exactly what she said, I really don't, but it was clearly making, t trying to tell them, you know, you, you, you can't vote today. And um, the other thing that I observed was when they didn't find them in the book, they really didn't have to do a lot more research. They, but for some reason they were doing this research on this little computer system that they have. And then after they would do that research, if they, didn't, they still didn't find them. They didn't want to give them an affidavit ballot. And I'm saying, give it to them. And they didn't like that I was saying that, and they didn't like that I was in the room, and they didn't like that I was telling the students, take a photograph of the ballot and the affidavit envelope. And some woman said to me, why are you saying this? Why are you, you're adding more stress. I said, because there's been so much election fraud around the country, I don't want to leave anything up to chance. And, it, you know, it, so what they would do is they, the more students that would show up, the longer this woman delayed them. Okay. Just explain, there was a line out the door, but inside the building, to get inside, to go to where the book was. Book. And if you were denied at the book, so you've already stood in line as a student, if you can picture. Now, there'd be a second line to go look up your registration by some other poll worker. And um, I am quite certain that they did this whole slowdown. Because I watched That's it operate more quickly. I watched their pace earlier right. in the day. The more students that were there, they the did longer she absolute they took. slowdown. Because that way, they wanted to, to, in my opinion, they were looking to discourage students so that they would leave. And, and, and I remember there was one student who just, she had to go to rehearsal and they said, please go ask your, your, uh, the director if you could take a few more minutes. I wish I had gone in with her and, and said, you have to give this affidavit ballot to her now. Don't waste any more of her time. She's got to go. But, you know, I was feeling it out. As I was, and then there was a point where I got so tired of the dagger eyes at me, so I went out into the lobby area where Diane was. And, and I gotta say, Diane was keeping notes and contact information from a lot of the students. I and, have their names and photos. And making all the necessary phone calls. I stood out there, and as groups of kids would come in, I would corral them and say, I'd take my little sign and say, I'm an official poll watcher, and I don't like what I'm seeing. And I want you to not be intimidated by these poll workers. If they tell you you're not registered to vote, insist on getting an affidavit ballot. I mean, ideally, they would have gone to get a court order, which is better, but they are far away from the court right. the campus. With no means, really, to and, get over and, there. Yeah, and it's, it's late, and they, have to, and they have classes, so I said, do not, I was really playing with them and they were, they were so appreciative thanking us because they, you know, the kids, if a grown up says to them, your vote won't count, don't even bother, they're uncomfortable, they're nervous. I said, don't let them intimidate you, insist on getting that affidavit ballot, do not leave without voting, if you do, I'm going to beat you up. <laughs> and they all laughed and they went in feeling a little more, um, Empower, I think. Yes, thank you. And um, we came to find out that the students from earlier in the day that had issues posted on some kind of a forum that they have, an online forum, that yes. it was combative, that it was literally hostile to go to vote. So the students later in the day were aware of this, and some of them brought some of a friend. Came back. Some of them that earlier in the day that I couldn't catch, we saw people come back together, where one would say, I, I voted earlier, but I'm, I'm helping her, you know. I don't think there were actually guys that came together, but a few girls came together saying uh, they denied her earlier and I'm here to help her. And, and the forum said also that you would be here, either one or two of us, and that we could ask you for help. So that whoever was informing this, this forum, um, I think it was a very good thing, but they were characterizing the situation pretty accurately by saying it was hostile and very intimidating. 
we were both so glad that we were there because, I mean, the kids were so appreciative. Kids were hugging us. I mean, some girls were crying. Yep, I was going to say, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, Two of the best for our phone numbers, which I gave. And then there was a there was a policeman, a, 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 a campus, campus policeman police came in, and Diane, we were concerned about when they were closing the polls that it would be very contentious. So Diane asked, could we have somebody come back when they're closing the polls? So we did have police presence in the room with us, which I'm sure... They sent the state trooper. And it I'm, was... It, the, the people looked like they were intimidated for the first time. And I think they were going to misbehave. I really do. They were awful. They were... As the day went on and as the evening progressed, they were worse. They came out the door, that one woman made faces at us. <laughs> like yeah, we were in third grade. She went... <laughs> and I said, Karen, did you see that? Yes. And they stood and started chuckling. They said, yeah, what's with them? adults? <laughs> yes. It was so, so ridiculous. It's like they all the And they, well, you know, look, to be fair, they were there from 5.30 in That's the morning. Right. And right. they worked until 10 o'clock at night. So it's a slightly long day. But <laughs> there, there are a couple of things that, I, that I've gotten complaints from a very broad swath, Rockland County and other places that the poll workers don't know anything. They're not, they're not properly trained. When I went in to vote, I, I, without mentioning any names, I mean, I vote there all the time, and it's the same people that are always there. But they're going, oh, we've got so many problems. And they told me what the problems were. And I said, this is not a problem. Just tell, tell people that those are the delegates with that candidate and those are the delegates with that candidate but you can vote for any six candidates that's all you're not yeah. telling them who to vote for you're just instructing them if people are confused Carol you triggered something by the later part of the by seven or so in the evening for the two hours from seven to nine students were coming outside and a few of these guys I have their names too were infuriated they were saying that the poll workers were telling them vote for and this is all Democrats by the way vote for either Bernie or for Hillary, and then vote for one delegate. One. one. And so the students could read. They said, it says, vote for six, or up to six. And they were yelling at the students, saying, you vote for one. I told you that's wrong. You have to vote for one. And so the students were inside having these confrontations. And I don't know how many listened and voted for one, but the few the fellows, Stefan was one guy, and another guy, Marcus, came out and said that they, they just voted for six and they knew that they, the poll workers were wrong. Earlier in the day I heard them and they were oh saying it correctly. God, they were saying just... vote for up to six. And you could vote, you could mix and match, you could vote along a straight line, however you want to do it. I know that they knew how to do it because I heard it earlier. When there were no lines, they said it just as it should be said. <coughs> Why they got into this vote for one delegate, how I really did, don't know. Excuse me, Diane. How did they know that student X only voted for one delegate? Because they're not supposed to look at their ballot. I know that. That's a very good question, Frank. I don't know how they knew, but I know that uh, I didn't ask whether it was an affidavit ballot, which they shouldn't see either. It goes oh, into an envelope. Right. It's sealed. Or if they were standing, there was only one machine and one carol for the people to stand at with four spots, mm -hmm. uh, which is a part of the delay also. And some of these students, they come between classes, and classes are in blocks. Yeah. And they have whatever it is, 20 minutes or 40 minutes between. And there wouldn't be enough time for them right. in the room. A few of the students came out of the room where I was in the lobby. There were tables, and a few of the poll workers at points, there were five, but the two women were the ones that came outside. The men never came into the hallway. Uh, they would chase these students and say, you can't take that outside. But I watched the students say, there's nowhere to do it inside, and mm -hmm. I need to do this now and leave. Mm -hmm. They were actual real ballots. Mm -hmm. So I could see that they would see what the people were filling out Hello. in those circumstances. So I don't know if they made it a practice to look at everybody's ballot throughout the day. Hi, Mary. That day, four, there were 452 votes cast <coughs> at Jimmy per purchase. That, that is a lot for one machine. 38% yeah. of those were done on affidavit ballots. Wow. Wait a minute, I just want to hmm. write this. One machine at SUNY. That is a lot for a machine. 283 of them were the actual ballots. In the machine. In the machine. 283 went through the machine. Votes. Machine. 
Uh, on the ballot, I thought it was 170 of affidavit ballots. 170 affidavit ballots, which is 38%. I, yeah, I, 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 I friends who went to Manhattan College and they said about a third of them were affidavit ballots. It's about the same. Mm -hmm. Like the same yes. thing with the guy just saw his registration and all the minutes was gone when they got down there. I'd love to tell you that the results were that Bernie had 278 votes and Hillary had four. 272. Wow. 272? And Hillary had four. Oh, yes. Had four. What is it? Well, that was in the machine. Bernie yeah. equaled how many of those? 272. 272. And Hillary had four. Well, H had four. That deals with the motor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, the, but the two hours without affidavit ballots, that they were, they ran out? They ran out? Oh, so the students can... told me that they were being denied at some point an affidavit ballot because they'd run out. So I called the board. Actually, Julie was calling me. Julie, a friend of yours, Hirsch. Julie. Julie Wiener. Wiener, there it is. And uh, they all know her. Yeah. I only met her that morning. She was outside, and she left when I arrived. Uh, she offered to call the board, and then after another half an hour, when I didn't see the board come with any affidavit ballots, and another student told me they were denied, I called the board. We both called the board, which caused them to come with a box of affidavit ballots. Later in the evening, they told us that they never ran out of ballots. Well, well, they had <laughs> more. How that works? They, they had more, them. and I was getting very nervous because we had no idea. They had a small stack, and I said, "I think you should get more." And then, like around eight thirty, the poll clo was closing, and wow. around eight thirty, somebody showed up from the board with a carton. Terry, I'm, yes. I'm an inspector also. Um, oh, I think we get a hundred affidavit ballots in English, and I think it's a hundred or maybe only fifty in Spanish and stuff like that. So at a, at a bigger polling place with more than 766 people. Oh yeah. There were no, 766 no, no. registered voters there. That's that, it's the same size, but uh, obviously if there are 170 affidavit ballots, they would they would run out. Right. Saying. Can I ask Diane, yes. um, there were four inspectors, right? Two Republicans and two Democrats. There were five, actually. And did they have a Plan B machine for the handicapped, blah, blah, blah? They did. Okay. They did have a Plan B. Yeah. Yes. And um, did, the, did the people have name tags on to identify themselves? That's stuff? a good question. Thank when you. I arrived, Bill had a name tag on, and another gentleman had a name tag on. I'm not sure that the women did, mm -hmm. but after we had our initial confrontation, they took off their name tags. And I asked the woman that was the most uh, aggressive if I could have her name. She said no. But we saw we got copies of what was signed. So we have four names. That dead. Whenever I could, I filled out forms on my phone. We had hard copy forms from the Bernie Sanders campaign. But it seemed too cumbersome. I only brought a few, and I didn't know how to get them to them. So I literally, when Carrie came, when I could, I would keep it open on my phone and, and fill out. I did roughly 30, I think. Uh, so some of those names I was getting from the students, and I didn't write hard copy, because I was making notes anywhere I could on the papers that I brought with me. Um, but I was sure to, you know, contemporaneously document this. So I called the U.S. Attorney that day and explained what happened with the Westchester Board. I called Arthur that day and explained to him what happened. Before the, uh, the evening was out, by about 8.30 at night, I wanted the AG's office to understand what was going on. So I called their hotline, and when I got through to the secretary, I said, I really want a lawyer, even if it's not to speak to them for a period of time. I just want my name and phone number taken, and I want somebody to understand what I've gone through here today with these students. Right. So I got to speak with a lawyer at the AG's office that was lovely. He said they were underwater, they were so swamped, but he appreciated that I wanted to explain that I had many issues that I'd witnessed that day. He took my contact information, and he gave me his direct line. Since that day, I've called him and not reached him, but I have his email address, and I've emailed him uh, this report that I put together. And I did that so that he would have it at his fingertips so that I'd have to take notes with me on the phone. There was just so much that went on. I have the names of probably 20 students and most of their phone numbers. Uh, right. What I feel badly about is there are that many and then some that I couldn't get to speak with. They could probably but locate others. I, I've got a question, too. Excuse me. Did you have to fight for every one of those 170 affidavit ballots to be given to these students? I would say that's a fair I assessment. I think so. Wow. I mean, I wasn't there in the beginning, but... Yes. But, uh, Once you came, though, you turned the people right back around, and it didn't change by later in the evening. 
there would still be students that came out and said they wouldn't give me one. And you talk them up and say you go back. back in there and get one. <laughs> and she said, sometimes I don't have to deal with me. <laughs> she, yeah, exactly. And she grabbed another student and go, you, you help this person. Do you know each other? Go in together. She really was doing that. The students I was, felt it I was them. playing around with them and they were, they, it was bolstering them to be able to go. It was scary for them. Right. They'd stand on I one said, line. you're an American. This is your right to vote. Go and ask for that. You may don't leave without voting. You it was a forty-minute investment for them. By the time they came out to say that they were unable to vote and they were unquestionably upset. Okay. Yes. Please. I have a suggestion, and that would be to pull this in with what I have a feeling happens all over the country with yes. students voting. Yes. Uh, because your sister in North Carolina. Cousin, yeah. Tremend I mean, and of course, North Carolina is just off the wall with, you know, their disenfranchising students. But the school that's right around where she lives, the college, had all kinds of problems. I mean, just ridiculous. You know, they didn't have any voting. I, I think it was way far away from the campus. Oh, that's they, another thing you didn't mention about sending the students to uh, well, no yeah. transportation oh, for them to get oh, right, there. you mentioned that. There was the right. one person she that was mentioned. told this, and then the, the lead poll watcher said out loud, because this is early in the day, this is still at 10, 10, 15 in the morning, oh, this is like the third of these today. This is the second or third of the students that registered to vote here, but are at the community house, at the purchase community house, you know, eight or nine miles away. And each of the students said, I don't have a car, I don't know how to get there. And so they left not voting. Um, I have to say that what you're saying I think is very accurate. Uh, based on just the limited exposure I've had, we were at SUNY Purchase. In Arthur's Threads, I saw a fellow, Sean, and I have his last name and I wrote to him. He hasn't written back. His email address was uh, on this email from Arthur in the day or two after voting. He was at Binghamton, at SUNY Binghamton, and had, I think, similar situations this has that happened there. And then, um, a fellow that I used his FOIA request, David, is a student at uh, SUNY, at uh, Stony Point, and he was a poll watcher in Suffolk. He encountered numbers of issues, and he sprung into action and was foiling the Suffolk board within a day or two, and he was all over it. Uh, is that Stony Brook? Or Stony, Stony Brook, yeah. Stony, Stony Brook. Stony Brook. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. So have you been dealing with Arthur a lot? Because I've been talking to him and I feel like he's not very helpful. Well, that's our experience as well. Yeah, that's yeah. another discussion. Can <laughs> <laughs> we talk about what happened with uh, Reggie? With the, uh, yes, that's, I wasn't there uh, uh, Well, so, so that once I, they finally got their affidavit Before ballots, we get to that, yeah. I would like to talk about when we just went to check, well, to find out for <laughs> that, uh, Allegra and I went to to the warehouse uh, in Orsley before the election, and we it, we it was made very clear there are no security cameras, there's no alarm system, there's, there's no security guards. There were two people with keys, a Republican and a Democrat. That they always left in the building. Very oh, the, and the keys were, and there were fourteen hundred and twenty voting machines in this huge warehouse with no protection. So right off the bat, we were uncomfortable before the primary. Um, and then, so we, we went to the warehouse again. Some people went to the warehouse, and some people went to the BOE, because at the warehouse, they were canvassing the machines, and at the BOE, or they were auditing the machines, and at the BOE they were canvassing the actual absentee ballots and affidavit ballots during last week. So, uh, Olivia, your point about the... About what happened to the affidavit ballots after they left? No, I would say, I would say what happened to the, I mean that's, yeah, but the, the auditing of the machines, that hmm. issue, about the numbers of machines. Yeah, um, I think it'd be more, yeah. Uh, there are about 1,400 machines and they're supposed to audit 3%. 
Um, but they picked 28, so they just they determined they needed to audit 39 machines, but they took 28, they had a big bag, it was very, it was good, it was very transparent, you could see what they were doing, nothing, you know, it was, they would, I mean, anybody can, anyway, they had bags of these little poker chips with a number of each machine on it, and they took one, 28 out of the one bag that had Plan A machines, and then they took 11 out of the bag that had the Plan B machines. Now, the Plan B machines have no ballots in them. So 10 of them were empty. One of them had four votes. So basically, I figured they really only audited 2% of the machines. So this is one thing I'm going to foil on, you know, how, you know, on what basis do they, does the law need to be fixed? Is this a odd procedure? It's obviously, to me, it's obvious. <laughs> this is in my opinion. <laughs> uh, this was just an effort to do less Ham County, because Ham County is a pain in the neck for the Board of Elections, and they don't want to do it. And, but it's the only way that we have some kind of check on the machines. Mm -hmm. So that was um, one thing. There, another thing that some of the machines had been withdrawn, so I want to foil that to find out why they were withdrawn, when they were withdrawn. You mean the ones that they didn't use? Or? Right. Yeah, they... Well, they, only, way it was trans they only use like uh, 900 and no, some. They laid out all the numbers of all the machines on the table, but some were missing. So they didn't use Oh, because use they didn't use those. all 1,400 machines. They used 900. Right, so why, what happened to those machines? And, yeah, right. so we don't know. But it was very transparent. You could see what they were doing. You could see everything was, you know, as opposed to what's going on inside the machines. We have no idea. Mm -hmm. This was the audit after. Yeah. Yes. After the right. Yeah. right. This is where, this is where hand, hand count. Or the disaster. So it's sort of yeah. interesting. They only had one machine. It, a huge college. So right, and there are so many machines and they had not used. Well, they, well they, they were probably broken. No, they were probably broken. Um, <laughs> well, we don't know. But also, Did that's they have, they have less polling no. places. Well, yeah, we don't. Yeah. Were any broken? Were there any missing seven, machines? Or what's that? What they yeah, no. usually provided? They didn't explain. Because I went to the warehouse with you as well, and TJ didn't explain how they were allocated. I mean, I what you know, like was a machine allocated to SUNY purchase, but they didn't show up. Was there a problem yeah, backing up from the back, from the scanner? No, we watched them. Okay, so the, the scanner was fine, so they didn't have a problem with that so, side of it. So then we get to the. I, I wasn't there for the absentee ballots, but that's pretty straightforward, I assume. Do the, and I don't know if they check everybody's registration. Yeah, we didn't get to witness their actual culling of the affidavit ballots. Were they what what? were they using to check the, uh, the affidavit ballot? I mean, they have a great explanation of what they're doing, mm -hmm. but what were they really, but what is the database? What's the book that they're checking these these affidavit ballots against? Was it the same defective database right. that they had used on election day, or it was expanded a little bit? Because, so 1,000 out of those 6,000 affidavit ballots, what was it, 1,000 I counted? 62, uh, exactly 6,275 affidavit ballots. And I'd have to do the math again. Uh, well, about 1,100 were actually deemed acceptable. Oh, so that's why like most weren't deemed acceptable. Correct. Why? Well, they, they tell you it's because they're not in the book. But the question that I have, what about the people who, who know that they right. changed their affiliation prior to October 9th and or know that they are new registrants by March 25th, but they're still eliminated because they're not in the book. They're not in the book because there was all this scrubbing going on illegitimately yeah. Yeah. since... I, I also want to talk about this, if I may. You know, again, this is conjecture, but you may all remember there was a, a, a security breach. The firewall. The firewall came down. The in DNC the DNC database. Thank you. Yeah. You know, the DNC, the, the uh, DNC DNC. database yeah. and the Sanders campaign was blamed for this firewall breach. How? It actually were in December, not played, but they were self-reported that they could see the data of other candidates. 